Good morning, everyone. Very glad to be here and more importantly to see so many folks come for this wonderful um, event and opportunity to talk about a subject that's, as um, uh, Dr. Um, Douglas said, not very well focused on in the U.S. Um, obviously, uh, more people are familiar with the Rwandan genocide and that got a lot of coverage uh, from the movie Hotel Rwanda, but there's, uh, even with just that one topic and one terrible uh, occurrence uh, many years ago now, there's way more to know about that than just that one movie or book. And so it's, and there's many other topics of um, genocidal issues in Africa that go on, um, continue to go on till today. So it's very wonderful we have this opportunity to have a variety of speakers to talk about that. Um, as my dad mentioned, uh, my connection to this or background with why I'm here, um, sort of tentative in that I'm not, uh, it's not something I uh, do professionally. I'm actually a fishery biologist. I work for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. But I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Gabon in Central Africa. And at the time, there was ongoing conflict and um, perhaps even genocide uh, occurring in the Republic of Congo, Congo Brazzaville. Uh, and I was in the south of Gabon serving uh, as a Peace Corps volunteer doing aquaculture and agriculture activities. And we had a, a large number of refugees who were coming into southern Gabon. And I ended up working with the UNHCR to uh, work with some of the refugees to help them find activities to, to get uh, involved in and, and settled in that region. So um, moving forward to what we're doing today, uh, I want to start out by talking about our keynote speaker, Dr. Tercis Semeninga. Uh, Dr. Uh, Semeninga is a native of Rwanda and a survivor of the genocide there, as was mentioned, against the Tutsis, and he is also a Canadian citizen. He was born in 1941 when Rwanda was transitioning from colonial rule to independence. After his secondary school, um, after attending secondary school at the Catholic Ruizira Seminary, he studied philosophy and the theology to become a priest but eventually left the seminary to study translation, biological sciences, biochemistry, and food biotechnology. He holds bachelor degrees in uh, philosophy and education, translation, and biological sciences, and a master's degree in nutrition and food science, and a PhD in biotechnology and food industry. When the genocide erupted in 1994, he was serving as a senior lecturer at the National University of Rwanda. He thankfully survived the genocide along with his wife and five children because of Hutu Jehovah Witnesses and their friends who intervened um, in the town of Batera to work uh, as a team to save them from the genocidal act, uh, occurrences that were happening. In 2003, he migrated to Canada with his family and now lives in Gatineau, Quebec. He's also the author of the book that was mentioned no Greater Love, How My Family Survived the Genocide in Rwanda. This book combines historical and biographical material that documents conditions in Rwanda prior to and in the wake of German and Bel um, Belgian colonialism, pointing out the traditional relationships between the Hutu and Tutsi, questioning the Hamitic myth and the master-servant system that shaped the hatred or shaped the ethnic divide. It also shows how the Hutu, Hutu and Tutsi identity developed um, ethnic hatred and divide in the 1950s, how the relationships between the Hutu and Tutsi worsened between the 1990 and 94 um, when the genocide began. And finally, the author relates his family's survival experience and the heroic activities of the Hutu Jehovah Witnesses who helped to save them. So I would like to um, now welcome Dr. Tercis Semeninga, who will be our first speaker for today. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, before I start my presentation, I would like to extend a heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Elmeida uh, and also to Dr. Weisberg for inviting me to come and talk about what I went through 
during the genocide. I think th these two people are a good example of collaboration in the academia. Because as they mentioned, so one is mostly involved in the Holocaust, and the other one is in a loser center, but they cooperated to make this conference happen. So, so I don't have to present myself because it, was, it has been already done. <laughs> so, but the only thing I would to emphasize here is that I'm, I'm a genocide survivor and as such, the main, the main reason I'm here is to give a witness to what happened to me and my family, so my wife and my five children, through the genocide. And even before and during the genocide, because we were targeted, persecuted, hunted down for slaughter, not because of my political or religious opinions, but because we belonged to the group or to the social group of the Tutsi. So now, moving to Rwanda, I'm, I'm going now to talk a bit about Rwanda. So as you know, Rwanda is a small country uh, in, in, Eastern, in Eastern Africa. And well, it's almost the size of Massachusetts. But it has a big, big population of 13 million now. Um, Rwanda, as you know, is a very beautiful country. It's known uh, especially for his um, mount mountain gorillas, his national parks, and also for his tradition of hospitality. And, but today, when you mention Rwanda, what comes to your mind is the genocide. A genocide, as you see, that took the lives of one million people in only 100 days. And that represented about 75% of the Tutsi population who, who were killed. Now, when you, you, you hear about the genocide, you may think, well, it's just a, a tribal war that happened in a distant land of Africa. And you might say that's no normal in, in, in uh, those kind of uh, remote regions because tribes have been killing uh, each other for centuries. Now, it is normal that uh, such a thing that, that, that as, a, as, a, uh, as a, um, a genocide occurs in Rwanda. But, the th I mean, the situation is much more complicated, as we are going to show. Oh, sorry. So let's go back. I say that because Rwanda was host to three social groups, the Hutu, the Tutsi, and the Twa. But which is special, what is special here is that they shared a common culture, language, and religious beliefs. And some other things, as you see in the slide, such as folklore, ritual, cuisine, dressing style, language, history, and, and so forth. So now, how can you explain that those th three groups sharing such things now came to, to, to hate each other and have what we, 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 we can see here? So now, if we go back to before the genocide, we, we can see that Hutu and Tutsi were living to, together in peace, but there were occasional tensions and hostilities between the Tutsi families for the succession to power. Because Rwanda has been ruled by one Tutsi family, and it was a monarchy, and then they, 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 they could be stra struggles between those uh, uh, Tutsi struggling or fighting for succession to, to, the, to power. But in, in general, 
in general, and there was no incident of, of group violence between Hutu, who represented 84%, and the Tutsi, who represented 15%, and the Tua, 1%. And that has been uh, going for at least 700 years. Now, how could, could we explain that in 1994, so Ordinary Hutu picked up crude weapons, clubs, spears, machetes, and slaughtered their Tutsi neighbors, work with workmates, fellow church members, and even their spouses. And also knowing that about 90% of Rwandans were Christians, and how can we explain that most people who died so in a genocide perished in, in churches? And about 200,000 people reportedly participated in the genocide. Of course, we know that those who participated, sometimes participated willingly, but others were forced to participate because they were threatened with death if they didn't take part in those killings. So now, in this keynote, our goal is to address four areas, four points. So we are going to see how the division between Hutu and Tutsi formed, well, and even developed to, to the point of genocide. Second, we'll, we'll see the events leading in, in, to the genocide of the Tutsi. And third, what happened to my family and the role played by a group of people named Jehovah's Witnesses in, in, in this, in our survival. And fourth, what else we can learn from the genocide in Rwanda. So now, let's just start with the first point. So in this first point, so we are going to explore the soil and seeds that produced the genocide. And we will see how the division between Hutu and, and Tutsi formed and reached to the point of genocide. So, so that now we are going to talk about colonialism, religion, and race, and the role that they played in, 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 in this. So as we know, in the early 20th century, Christianity came to Rwanda through German and and Bel 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 Belgium, as so they are colonizers. Now, how did, how did it happen? Early, or at the beginning, early in the, nine, in the 90s, um, hundreds, so Catholic missionaries arrived in Rwanda and founded what we call missions or parishes in, in the country. Yeah. Now, second, uh, you know that when, when German lost the, the war, at least it, it, German was losing the, the war at that time, it was re replaced by, by Belgium in 1916. Now, when Belgium c came to Rwanda, uh, they chose a strategy of divide and rule. How? Uh, be because when they came, they found that the Tutsi and the Hutu were living together in harmony. So they were ruled by the, the Tutsi monarchy, but all loved that kind of ru ruling. And, and, and I mean, the ruling was uh, what we would call a, a patron self servant system, but all of them were under this system and they were living peacefully. Now, when the, the, the cat, I mean, the, 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 the Belgian came, so they, they favored the Tutsi. They favored the Tutsi. So they cultivated ties with the ruling class, and they, especially the, 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 the Tutsi monarchy. Now, they, they favored the Tutsi, giving them more education uh, than, than to Hutus, also giving them 
uh, political p positions and just removing Hutus from political p positions. Now, then there's an, another a special thing. When they came to Rwanda, so they came with uh, an, a, a conviction that the, the white were superior to other, other races, and when they came to, to Rwanda and, yes, and, and to, to Uganda, they found, found something special. Why? They, they found in, in Rwanda and in, in, uh, in, 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 in Uganda, well, an organized, an organized society. So, so they couldn't understand that. Why Africans were able to organize such a structure and well, rule the country in an organized way. So, so th let's look at the uh, look at the uh, political and social organized they, they found in Rwanda. Well, when they came to Rwanda, they they saw that. The Rwanda was ruled by a king and who shared the power with the queen mother. So that's what it shows here. And um, the king and the queen mother were cooperating with what we call the keepers of the secrets of royal succession. The name in Rwanda, in Rwanda is Abiru. So this is the, f the first level of, com of command. Now, next, the king and the queen mother ruled the country using what we call chief of the chiefdoms and sub chiefs of the kingdom of chiefdoms, chiefs of the hills, chiefs of the villages. So this is the hierarchy of ruling so through the king and the queen mother and the other uh, who, I mean the, the other chiefs who were under, under them. But they were also chiefs of the cattle, chiefs of the lands, and also the, we, we had the chiefs of the army, and the, the chiefs of the army could also use informants or whistleblowers, which, which we could call spies today. So th this is the, the organi organization, the social organization, the political organization that they found in, in uh, Rwanda and in, in Uganda. Now, this is a sample of Rwanda's Tutsi royal family's member who ruled the country during the 66 years before monarchy was uh, to toppled yeah, or overthrown. So this, well, I, I, when, when um, I was born, so this, this King Rudahigwa was ruling, yeah, and I also wa was here when King Chigeri um, ruled. But you know that the monarchy wa wa was uh, toppled in 1962. So now, let's go back to the notion of white superiority, and because it was a puzzle for. Uh, uh, I mean, for, for Belgians and, and uh, Germans who came to, to Rwanda, it was a puzzle. How could it be that Africans could have such an organization? So to explain this organization, they said so Rwandans, uh, uh, not, not Rwandans, but Tutsis are not native of Rwanda. They are na actually, they are not really black or um, Africans, but th they are probably descendants of uh, uh, Noah's son called Ham. So that's why they invented what they call the Hamitic theory. So the Hamitic theory goes as follows. It says that any advance in civ civilization that is found, uh, that are found in, in um, in, 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 in Africa has been imported, by, imported or brought by Europeans. So now, that's why they said so these people must not be 
native of, of Rwanda, of Africa, but they came through, through Egypt or Ethiopia to Rwanda, and they conquered the Dhaka, Bantu, Hutu. So th they imagined that those people had inherited intelligence, courage, natural leadership abilities, uh, and th they could also see some physical features which were, which were different from uh, other people in, uh, in, in Rwanda. But in the, the, the reality was far different. Because to Rwandan people, Hutu and Tutsi are, were not tribal or racial categories. So Hutu and Tutsi were rather labels uh, that identified the person's social or economic status. Why? Because most Hutu were farmers, and most Tutsis were uh, cattle herders or landowners. So, also intermarriage, so between Hutu and Tutsi especially, further blurred the lines between Hutu and Tutsi. So, but even though th this was clear, they, they instituted the colonial, I mean the, 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 the ra racial sup superiority, yeah, because it was much help helpful for them to rule the, ca the country. So, okay, let's go forward. Now, because of, um, now, insisting on, on, on this uh, 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 racial superiority, they created and stalked ethnic tensions. Okay. So, oh, sorry, sorry, I should, should go forward. So the, the colonial powers took me a myth of racial superiority mm -hmm. and made it come true by educating and empowering Tutsi, as I said before. So they gave them education, they put them uh, in um, uh, well, prominent positions, and um, they also t tried to identify people by using crude measures such as a person's height, the shape of the nose, or the number of cattle, um, and the, the amount of land they owned. So this is how they, they measured physical features using those instruments. Then uh, so they measured the length of the nose uh, and face, height, skin color, number of cows owned, time period of migration to Rwanda, and the, all this became racial categories erecting hard barriers between Hutu uh, and Tutsi. And later in 1931, uh, so they, they instituted a, an ID card, identified Rwandans as Hutu, Tutsi, and Tua. So now another thing to, to mention in, 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 in this uh, uh, is the collaboration between the church and the colonial political authorities to maintain power. So, you see that the Hamitic myth became a soil for hard barriers between Hutu and Tutsi, especially in politics. So, as I mentioned, Hutu the chiefs were dismissed from their political position, and the Tutsi were installed in, in their place. And in the religion, only Tutsi could become priests and nuns. And uh, just to mention my experience when I was schooling to become a priest, most of the, of the pu pu pupils and the, the students were Tutsi, and we had just a, a very few Hutu at, in the school. And um, well, and you see, uh, and all, there were all, was also a hierarchy of the Rwandan Catholic Church reflected belief, uh, uh, reflecting belief in the Hamitic myth, and church authorities instructed me, the missionaries to, to concentrate on converting Tutsi, and the, their strategy um, were con was to convert the Tutsi first so that the, the population could follow. And that's what, what happened um, because in, in uh, 1931, so a, day, a decade before my birth, Belgian author authorities enthroned a Catholic 
educated Tutsi king named Charles Rudahigwa, and because he became a Catholic, tens of thousands of Tutsi followed and converted to Catholicism, including my grandparents and my parents, and this was uh, uh, called a wave of mass conversions named the Tornado Conversions. Okay, now let, let's uh, see a bit my journey. So, so as, as it was ma mentioned in, in uh, well, <coughs> in, in the, the presentation, <coughs> so when, when I was a child, I, I, I grew uh, uh, in, in a, a devout Catholic ch um, family, and I would accompany my parents to, to attend masses uh, at the mission or the, the parish of Zaza. And I was especially impressed by the dedication, the dedication of uh, the white uh, fathers and the white sisters um, uh, because they were building schools, they were building hospitals, they were also taking care of the poor. And this impressed me. I considered them to be um, men and women of God. So th that's why I, I, when I, I, I was, um, I was uh, about 13, I'm 14, so I moved from my, vi my village to, to go and attend what do they call a, a, a minor seminary, or it's a kind of boarding high school, uh, where uh, I was uh, well, taught Latin and Greek because I, uh, I had to become a priest, and other subjects like uh, languages and science. Um, then uh, after that, I, I, I went to the major seminary. Uh, the major seminary was in Congo, actually, because uh, I had chosen to become a Salesian, which is, is a kind of uh, well, group of, of priests who are called Salesians. Now, um, then, as you see, from 1960 to 1961, Something happened to my, my father and to the Tutsi in general uh, because there was a, a kind of, 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 uh, of ch change or major changes in, in, in Rwanda. So the monarchy was toppled and um, the, the Belgians now, now favored the Hutu because uh, the Tutsi were asking for independence and that, that was not uh, pleasing to Belgians. So they, they switched sides and encouraged the Hutus to, to overthrow the monarchy and they instituted, they instituted the, 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 the republic. So now because of that, my father who was uh, supporting the monarchy so had to, to, was first put in, in prison, then when he was released to, to prison, he had to flee to Uganda with, with his family. But I, I stayed in, in Rwanda because I was still completing my, my secondary school yeah, at the, at the minor seminary. So going forward, from 1963 to 1971, I continued my study of philosophy and theology in the Congo with the, with the Salesians. Uh, but now, I didn't become a priest because on, on, on the way, I, I, I realized that even discrimination and, uh, was inside the church, and I, I was quest questioning my, 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 fu my, my future vocation as a priest. So, so for example, he was denied the opportunity to, to study theology and, and philosophy in, in, at the university because I, wa I, I was a bla black. So, so I decided to quit and, 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 and I went to study bi biology, uh, biological science at the University of Kisangani in, 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 in the Congo. Then, um, because of what happened in, in, Congo, in, the, in the Congo at that time, with what they called Zairization, so, so they, they, they chased all um, white t teachers. And so I had to move from Congo and go to Europe, to Italy. That's how I, I continued my, my studies in Italy. Then after completing my, my studies in, in Italy, in Italy so I went back to, to, to Rwanda and was teaching to, to, uh, at the University of Rwanda from 1977. And uh, while teaching there, I, make, I made an encounter with uh, a colleague who had become 
uh, one of Jehovah's Witnesses in, in, in Belgium. And uh, well, I was impressed by his kindness and um, his lack of the, the, the discrimination. And he was not really part of the Hutu who, who were discriminating people. And he, he showed love to me. And I was impressed by his honesty and also by the fact that whatever he believed was, he could show, show me in the, in the holy book. So I became one of Jehovah's Witnesses in, in 1983. So, and, and as I said, the, 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 those people don't t take weapons either. Um, and that's, that's why during the genocide, so, so they behave differently. And uh, the reason why I'm here is, is, is why they helped to, to me to survive. So, <coughs> so let's, let's now go forward and, and see the event, the events that led to, to, to the genocide. <coughs> so, <coughs> now, you know that in 1990, so the, 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 rebel, the rebel army, which actually was formed outside Rwanda by the, the, the Tutsi diaspora who fled Rwanda in, 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 in the 1950s, so, uh, especially 19, between 1959 and 1973, so those re Tutsi rebels formed an army and attacked Rwanda uh, from Uganda. That was the, the beginning uh, of the trouble in, in, for Tutsis inside the Rwanda. Now, <coughs> when they attacked, the, the Hutu launched a hate, a hate propaganda telling people, you know, uh, Tutsi are attacking from, I mean, from Uganda and they are coming to conquer power and also restore the, um, the uh, patron and servant system, so they are going to oppress you. They also are planning to, to kill the Hutus. So this was the, the, the propaganda which, which was uh, uh, so overcast on, 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 the, on the radio. So because of this, and because the, the, the propaganda lasted three years, the hate of propaganda, and because of this lasting propaganda, pe people really changed their minds and, and became very wicked. So, so I, I, I told you about the rumors who, 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 which were spread. For example, in, in my case, the, the co my colleagues spread the rumor that I was hiding uniforms for the rebels and, and that I had dug a hole in my home, uh, where rebels, uh, rebels would bury uh, the, the, the Hutu, they, they would kill. So they invented many, many, many stories. Well, so, so you, you can now feel how my Hutu neighbors, who had been good friends, became enemies. So I, had, I said that they have been good friends, but some of them were, Organized my marriage some some years before when I married Shanta when I married in 1978, but they came very very wicked, and even one of them later will lead the um, presidential guards to kill to kill me. I will talk about it later. So now, then on, now when in, on August fourth. 1993, so there were some um, attempts, uh, attempts to, um, to, to sign what they call the Arusha Accords, and a set of protocols um, to end the, this three-year three war between the government and, and the Republic of Rwanda and the Rwandan Patriotic Front. So, but th these uh, efforts were um, not successful uh, because they signed the accords by, by, and the protocols by never, never followed them. So what will happen is that while they, they were signing the, the accord, 
uh, and even after signing them in 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 in, in uh, Dar es Salaam, so on April 6, so there was a what do they call a genocide trigger because the the plane were bringing back the the, the president of, of Rwanda to to Kigali, so w was shot down by a, a two ground to soil missiles and all people on, on the plane were perished, including the president of Rwanda and the president of, of, of Burundi, Cyprien Hadjamira, both Hutu, and 10 more people, including the French crew. So this, as I said, was a, a kind of trigger of the genocide. So let's see now what really happened. So. What is not really normal is that when, um, when the, the, there was this uh, incident, so UN troops were withdrawn from Rwanda instead of being increased. So even though the, um, the, the Canadian, um, uh, well, the Canadian um, officer, Romeo Dallaire, asked the UN to increase the, the the, the number of troops, so they didn't, they didn't, uh, we listened to him and, and they even withdrew the tr troops, the UN troops from Rwanda. So this, it was just giving free, free way, free way to, to the, the killers. So as you see, ordinary people in cities and villages were incited to kill neighbors, colleagues, fellow churchgoers and relatives. Uh, Tutsi and moderate Hutu were killed in their homes or rounded up and taken to slaughtering sites. So dead bodies were thrown into latrines, common graves, and trenches that had been dug for that purpose. So now it, there was no way to flee because all paths and roads were guarded by militiamen armed with machetes, uh, clubs, grenades, and other crude weapons. And if a person didn't have an ID card, they would look at their heights, the, the shape of their nose, the length of their neck, the color of their skin to decide if they were Tutsi and had to die. So you remember the card and the, the measures I, we, we mentioned before. So now the, the, the genocide was implemented using crude weapons, as you see here, the, the collection. So we had spears, knives, clubs, machetes. Uh, all those uh, things were, were, were killed. I mean, were used to, to kill pe people uh, in a short time. It was reported that the killers could, could e even kill um, about 10,000 in, 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 in 20 minutes, in 20 minutes use, using the, those, the, those weapons. So. So now let's go and look closer to what exactly happened to my family uh, during the 75 days of horror, anxiety, and fear, but also of brotherly love. Yeah, so now <clears throat> we are going to see that during the genocide, my, my family and I had to, to, to hide um, for 75 days in nine different places, and we, we had to move in small groups to go from a place to another to maximize the chances of survival. So we had to move by one, two, or three people at, at the autumn, at, at most. Yeah, then, well, when we, le we, we, we first left our home, so, one of, of my, my friends, my friends, who was one of Jehovah's Witnesses, came and took two ch children to, to his home. Uh, but me, uh, my wife and I and the three other remaining children followed another path and went to hide somewhere until um, our friend Adolf told his friend to come and collect us from the, the hiding. So. Now, this, uh, well, this project, we, we could say, of our survival 
came true because uh, at least 20, 20 Hutu Jehovah's Witnesses worked as a, as a team well, to, to make it happen so through the 75 days. So now <coughs> let's look closer at this period. So now, as I mentioned, uh, w the, there was the shooting of the, 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 um, the presidential plane, and when it was shot, shot down, there, there was a, well, a resuming of the fighting between uh, the Tutsi rebels and, uh, and the, the government army. That was the first thing. Now, uh, and the, as you remember, this happened on, on the 6th of uh, April 1994. Now, starting uh, fr from April 7th, so we, we had a, an urgent message uh, telling everyone to, to stay at their homes. If they left homes, it, it, it was at their risk. And um, so we had to stay at, at our homes. Well, and this didn't help because we co you couldn't flee. So they could just come because they have lists that have been established before. They knew where Tutsi were living. So they could come and go from home to, to, to home and collect people, uh, kill them at their homes or in the streets or uh, lead them in, 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 in um, in woods or forests to, to kill them. There were so, some specific uh, killing s uh, sites. So, um, now, I actually, I was living in, in, in the south and the genocide started in, 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 in Kigali and um, before it reached the south, it took two, two weeks. But during those two weeks, we were inside our homes, we couldn't move. and. So we were cut from our neighbors, our relatives and friends. So, so we could just eat whatever we had in, in the fridge, whatever was uh, available. And uh, so in this period, I, I, I attempted to, to hide my family. I tried to hide them in a, an empty uh, house that was left by, by one of my colleagues to, who went to his village. But when his uh, night, night watch was watching his house so me, he, he said, if you go there, I'll, I'll kill you and kill all your family. So I abandoned the idea. I ran to the, uh, to the Belgian um, uh, doctor with, with, without borders who were in the vicinity and I told them I, I was going to die with my family. So they, they sent me away saying we are not here to, to help refugees. I mean, fugitives to hide. We are here to to treat the, the injured. So I went to, to, to my home and just say, said a, a prayer to my God, and wait for for well, waited for 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 death or for the solution. But in the meanwhile, what happened? So is that one of, of one of, of, of Jehovah's Witnesses? As I told you. Uh, came and took us out of our home just 20 to 30 minutes before my colleagues Bernal led a group of of presidential guards into my home to kill me and they didn't f find us in, at home because we had just left so that's what I was mention mentioning here so now <coughs> uh, so now the, the, the next uh, the next days, so after leaving our home, we, we, we went to, to, to hide at uh, Jehovah's Witnesses' home, which was in another village. And, uh, but he, the, the, that friend hid us just w one night because the following day, all the vi vi village, vill villagers knew we were hiding there, so we had to move. And, the next day, we had to, 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 to hide in, in a, a reed thicket be behind the house for about 12 hours from 3 uh, p p.m. to 3 a.m. The, the following morning. So, and we were hidden here by a Hutu 
who was not a Jehovah's Witness, but who, who knew Jehovah's Witnesses, and he suggested that we would go there for a while. Then later, he would come and correct us. Yeah. So now, and he does in, 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 in his uh, gold shark. We will see the gold shark later. Now, we, we, st we stayed in, in, in the gold shark for about one month from uh, April 21 to May 25th. So that's what is mentioned here. And that's the, the gold shark is, is coming. Yeah, that's where we hid for one month. And now this was, uh, this uh, hut was close to a, a marketplace. And when people were going by to the marketplace, we, we could hear stories of rape, robbery, torture, and killing, as well as gunshots. Uh, we, we were through the thin mud gold shark, as you see. And we were there, seven people, so n no window. Um, no, 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 no op opening. Just a door for the, for the goats, and we stayed there for a month. So eating w once a day, a, a barrel of, of sorghum, and we couldn't wash for the, all that period. So we had uh, lice and and fleas in in our in, in our hair, in our clothes. Um, we were just ro rotting. So, so that's why we, 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 we experience foul air, asthma, fleas and rice, as we say here. Okay, now, in June, in June so we, 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 we had to, to, to move from, um, f from the, the, the hut I showed you. Um, so, uh, and uh, we, we, we had to move to a, a, another place we call the, the cave or the underground room. Um, but in the meanwhile, um, the, 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 the rebels had taken Ch Chigali. Mm. So, um, and, and that's why we're leaving before, we, we, before uh, when we moved from the hut, we went here and here we see uh, a house belonging to a single, a single Jehovah's Witness, and he was li living close to his mother's house, but he never told his mother that we, he was hiding ten people in total. So, my family of, of seven and other three Jehovah's Witnesses. So, this place was a, a, about a, a 6.5 by 6.5 by 6.5 and. Um, in, in his uh, an underground room for over four weeks we stayed there and w so as you know it was a small place we, we couldn't even sleep we had just to, st to stand or sit with our, b uh, our backs to, to, to were against the walls and all had to stand uh, to allow one to rest and sleep was I impossible so <coughs> Now, now, then we uh, actually uh, uh, um, at the end of uh, of uh, no, at the beginning of July, towards fifth of July. Uh, <coughs> so we we so the RPF took the city of Butare, and twenty RPF soldiers came to 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 take us from the hiding place. To, to a survivor's camp. So, so th that's basically <coughs> so the, the end of our, how we survived. But so as I told you, when we went to the, to the um, uh, survivor's camp, mm. so we, we could meet some other survivors and know more about what happened in some other regions. So that, that's how we, we, we could learn that uh, uh, between sh my wife and I lost 120, 120 um, uh, people in, in our close relative and my, my wife, uh, I mean in, in our close families. 
Now, I, I would rather emphasize the, 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 now the, the role that was, was played by Jehovah's Witnesses in this, uh, in this project. But before that, we have to know that more than 100 people, 100, 100 Jehovah's Witnesses were killed out of 2,500 uh, Jehovah's Witnesses who were in Rwanda at that time. So, so w w when we moved to the to, to this um, uh, c camp, we, we, we found that it was not such a, a safe place uh, b because uh, they were the stench of death everywhere around the camps, uh, and even when we, we went to to to, f to fetch water or. or uh, or firewood, we, we could encounter, encounter rotting body parts, and well, some parts we even were, 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 were somehow <laughs> roasted. I don't know how, how but uh, so we could f find parts of dead, dead people there. It was not su such a, a secure place to, to, to live, but uh, later on we were, we were moved to to um, in another city. Now, uh, let's now uh, talk about the role played by uh, Jehovah's Witnesses in, in, our, in our survival. Uh, we, we, we want to stress the two facts. One is what the Jehovah's Witnesses call neutral stand. Uh, and the neutral stand is based on the, the declaration in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 22 and verse 21 that says, pay back therefore Caesar's things to Caesar, but God's things to God. So what does it mean? So being neutral is not being indifferent or adopting inertia, um, but b b being neutral um, is d doing things, uh, so you, 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 you think, uh, well, must be d d done to, to the state, to the government. To give an example, if the government orders Christians to, to pay taxes, they do, they do pay taxes. So if they order to um, respect or obey, uh, um, I mean, uh, traffic regulations, they obey traffic re regulations. So they, they do community work. Um, so they take their children to school. So when they are sick, they, they go to hospitals to, to seek treatment. So, but being neutral for Christians means also uh, abstaining, doing things that, that are contrary to their beliefs that are embedded in, in, in the gospel. For example, if they are, um, uh, we, if they are ordered to take weapons and kill the, their neighbors, they do, don't do that. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses uh, did. In, they refused to take weapons and kill people. If they are ordered not to preach, so they can't obey because it is a, a command given by the Lord to, to preach the good news. So, so that, that's uh, how the, 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 the first fact for Jehovah's Witnesses and. The second is that the, the, there are people who remain united, and they remain united despite ethnic differences in, 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 in Rwanda. So no, none of Jehovah's Witnesses participated in, in the genocide, and this fact was recognized by even um, human rights organizations and by people who investigated in, in, into the, the genocide in Rwanda. So, they didn't t take part in, in, in the killings. So also, as, as I said, they, so they, they refused to, 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 to take part in the killings. Um, they, but they did even more that because they, they took risks uh, to save others. As I said, my family and other families were rescued by Hutu Jehovah's Witnesses because they, they they risked their lives to save others. Some were killed, some were even injured because they, they tried to help Jehovah, uh, other people. So, 
so th this, um, but what we could also mention, they had a good reputation in the community. They were people who were considered as uh, honest people, uh, people, people who respect others, who love each other. Now you could ask, why did over 20 people risk their lives to help my family? No, it is because of their conscience, because their conscience was educated uh, by high moral principles such as love of neighbor, love of uh, and, and, and uh, loyalty to their creator. So because of this, so they re refused to do things that other people did. Um, and and th then, it, it, I think for all of us, it is a wonderful message that each of us should meditate on every, on, on every day basis. So you could ask yourself, my, is my conscience well equipped and prepared to go beyond my comfort zone and my personal interest to protect the life of my neighbors, even putting my life at risk. So, and what, what exactly Jesus, the great man who ever lived on earth, said, no one has greater love than this, this that someone should surrender his life, life in behalf of his friend. So and that was actually the inspiration for my, my book, uh, which is No Great Love, so how my family survived the genocide in, in Rwanda. So before I, I t talk about, about this, let me just uh, tell a story of how Jehovah's Witnesses tried to help my, 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 uh, my, 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 my my sons, my younger sons, because in, during the genocide, I mean, uh, males were, were actually hunted, hunted down um, to be killed, and I had three, three sons. So the, the youngest, who was called Benjamin, was seven years. So to save him and help him come to the underground room, which was our last our, our last stay before the genocide ended. So the Hutu invented a trick. So they dressed him as um, a, twin, a twin brother to a Hutu young one, uh, his age, and so they gave him a ride in to, 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 to the place where we were. And nobody well, noticed that he, he was a Tutsi because he was just giving given a ride with a, another boy, and so they, they came and, and, and reached us in, in the underground room. The other boy was called Joel, was dressed as, uh, dressed as, as a girl, and they had to teach him how to, to, to walk as a girl. Uh, after that, <coughs> so he was mixed into a, a Hutu uh, a group of, of um, <coughs> of girls going to a market. So they pretended to go to a market and he was put in, inside the group in the in between uh, in, in the middle and they just walked to the to the to the market and so they, they could he could also join join us in in the in, in our last uh, um, uh, stay in, in, in the, the underground room. So just these are some details to, to, to show how, how lovely they were and how they re really uh, cared for us and, and were, were really <coughs> well preoccupied by our su survival. So now, <coughs> let's now give some uh, concluding remarks about uh, this presentation. <coughs> Sometimes we, 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 we wonder what are the similarities, for example, what are the similarities between the Holocaust and the Rwandan genocide? And another question is, what is the unicity of the Rwandan genocide? And how can a tragedy such as a genocide affect the life of a survivor like me? And what lessons can you, young and older ones, learn from the Rwandan genocide? So starting with the first point, Let's see that both the, both the Holocaust and the genocide 
took place un under the cover of an armed conflict. <coughs> so you remember World War II, and you remember also the general, I mean the conflict between uh, the, the Tutsi rebels and, and the, uh, the uh, government of Rwanda. So this is important because when there is an armed conflict, hmm, you are not sure of things which are being done during those, this, those conflicts. Okay. Then there would uh, also the, the target was to exterminate a group. So, and there was also they belonged to they they, they were killed because they they belonged to their group. So they were defenseless, and also seen as a final solution. The unicity of the Rwandan genocide is that two, I mean uh, Tutsi were killed by their fellow Rwandan Hutu citizens inside Rwanda. And the killers were the militia, the presidential guard, the regular army and the police, but also with the participation of a good portion of the, the ordinary Rwandan population. And the Rwanda genocide is the fastest genocide of the 20th century and probably of human history. And um, now, it, 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 this a tragedy like this can affect us physically, emotionally, and me mentally, because we, we live with fear and anxiety that we can be harmed. So we have a feeling of revenge and this sentiment that we, have, we had to fight against, and also sometimes we develop the guilt of survival. So we ask, why did I survive and other perished? Um, so, and the, 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 I mean, the healing can t take uh, uh, last for for life. And uh, lesson we can learn is a lesson of patience, endurance, humility, obedience, and resilience. Mm. So I didn't have a chance to mention that uh, during our hiding, uh, hiding. So we, so for example, we had to to use um, a, a small a small um, uh, plastic ba basket to, as a toilet in, in those uh, c confined place. Uh, and um, so we had to go in, in and, and uh, uh, to go and use it as a toilet. So in the first place, you are ashamed to do this because you see your children around you. So we are ashamed, but it becomes a habit. Then you do this, and then you smell things. And, but our host was so so kind and he could t take the, the, the bucket on a daily basis and wash it and bring it back. So now, also we can see that humans are vulnerable because if you, do, you don't have guidance, you, you can do bad things that happen in Rwanda. Young people were, well, you listen to propaganda and became uh, just killing machines. Mm. So. So we should avoid propaganda. Now, this is my family. And this, this photo was taken ab about two months after the genocide. So you, you can see uh, uh, at the back row, left from left to right, you see my wife, Chantal. Then you have uh, Jennifer and Godfrey Bin. So it's a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses who visited after the genocide. And then you see me. And then in the front row, you can see P. P. L. My son, he's second in birth, and uh, Joel, who is uh, fourth, and Benjamin, who is last, and Naomi, who is third, and Mary Providence, who was first born. Yeah, so all, all of them are in, in uh, Canada, in, except Mary, who, who is in Switzerland. She's now, well, she, she's uh, almost 45. Yeah, 45, and she's married and has a child. So. All other children are, are married except Benjamin. So that's the end of my presentation. So thank you for listening and for being with, with, uh, with me.